Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Test, test, test. One, two, three. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Am I speaking to anybody? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Well, that was great. I, I did a lovely little introduction there for, for, for nothing. Oh, well. Let's just continue on. The show must go on. The, the replay of this is going to look like crap because I got this big old long... Uh, what I'm probably doing is I'll actually uh, edit that video out. Anyway, okay. So... Welcome to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding video chat for, uh, man, this, this, this really sucks. Anyway, <laughs> I thought I had it all working here. I mean, it looks, looks right. But anyway, I had to just, I unplug it, plug it back in, unplug it, plug it back in. And eventually the darn thing works. So anyway, well, let's have it go. Uh, if you're brand new to these video chats, I want to welcome you. It's it normally doesn't go like this. It normally just works right off the bat, but uh, obviously to this today we didn't have it working right so let's continue on uh the way these work is i'm going to be hanging out here and answering your video your questions on the video chat so if you have anything that you would like to discuss with regards to building muscle losing fat uh, any specific challenges that you're dealing with when it comes to your workouts or your nutrition program please feel free to post those in the video chat window and i'll do the best i can to help you out uh, last week, we didn't have a video chat because I was actually away. Uh, I was out in Vancouver, British Columbia, and attending a fitness mastermind event. And this is what I was talking about while I was muted and nobody could hear what I was saying there. Uh, but bottom line, uh, one of the things that I am in the process of doing right now is I need some help to expand my business and to, to grow so that it can ultimately reach more people. And one of the things that I'm looking for is a personal assistant to help me so if if you are now the, the first position that i'm looking for is for a local assistant so this only applies to people who actually live in newfoundland canada specifically in conception bay south mount pearl st john's somewhere in those areas where you're within like a 20 minute drive of my place right here and if you would like to come on board and join the total fitness bodybuilding team send me an email and I'll, I'll let you know the details. I actually posted about this on my personal Facebook page today, as well as on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook page. So if you're interested in learning more and coming to join the Total Fitness Bodybuilding team, uh, you can check that out. I put a, a job application there. So if, again, email me at lee at leehayward.com, lee, L-E-E, L -E -E, at leehayward.com, if you are interested in joining the team. Now, with that being said, let's move on to the show because we've had enough dilly-dallies with this whole audio issue. Oh. Okay, I'm going to start at the beginning and just do some rapid fire through this. So if you're, if you're brand new to the video chats, let me know and just put a letter N in the chat. If this is your first time ever tuning in to a live video chat, and if you're a regular, put the letter R. I'd like to know just what kind of uh, audience we have joining us. If I, I commend you if you're brand new and you actually stuck with me through this whole uh, 10 minutes of, of muted audio there coming through. So if you stuck with me for that length of time, I commend you. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, starting off, we have um, Sean is joining us. Uh, it's a quick question there. He's saying, when you're cutting, should you still strive to train with progressive overload? Yes, you still want to try and train with progressive overload. However, you have to be aware that if you're in a calorie deficit, you're probably not going to make the same strength gains. In fact, you're not going to make the strength, same strength gains as if you're in a calorie surplus. But you still try to. You still strive to. I don't recommend people to purposely do this whole lightweight for cutting, uh, you know, and, and heavyweight for bulking. It, it doesn't work that way. You still want to try and train hard and build muscle even while you're cutting. It's just that you have to be aware that obviously on a calorie restricted diet, you're just not going to make the same gains uh, in, in your big heavy exercises. However, in certain exercises, you may actually see some improvements like in your body weight exercises or uh, sometimes in isolation exercises, if you're doing higher reps, you may actually perform better 
when you're losing body weight and you're in a calorie deficit. But in the big, heavy compound lifts, you know, again, the, the, the bench, the squat, the deadlift, the rows, the overhead press, the big, heavy movements, uh, those generally suffer as you lose body weight and when you're in a calorie deficit. But regardless, you still want to try and push yourself to gain strength. Uh, Jesse's joining us. He says, if I were to stay on a maintenance calorie diet and stay pretty clean with my diet, would I still be able to drop weight or do I need to be in a slight deficit? Uh, thanks. Appreciate your advice. All right. Um, you can do what's known as recomposition. If you have a clean diet, that's a maintenance calorie diet and you're training consistently, consistent with your cardio, very high quality food, it's possible to actually build lean muscle while simultaneously burning body fat so that your body weight doesn't change that much, but your body composition does. And this is very common for people who are new to working out or coming back to the gym after a layoff. Uh, very often you see uh, guys in, in this situation where there's, there's not a lot of change on the scale, but they're getting stronger, they're increasing their energy, they're getting leaner, and ultimately what's happening is they're building muscle while burning body fat simultaneous, simultaneously. Uh, but generally what happens is you'll eventually get to the point where uh, you're probably going to want to focus primarily on one or the other, right? I mean, that that's great to do for, for the average Joe who just wants to, you know, get in shape, and th there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're like really trying to fill up your frame with muscle, right? You'll want to be in a calorie surplus. Or if you're really trying to tap in to burn off that stubborn body fat and, and get leaner, you want to be in a calorie deficit. But uh, if, if you're already kind of like happy with your conditioning and you just want to, to make some general improvements, then it's okay to kind of focus on uh, a maintenance calories and just being really consistent with your training and your cardio. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm not purposely trying to bulk. I'm not purposely trying to cut. Uh, I just wanted to improve my fitness and kind of maintain my body weight where it's at. So that's basically what I'm doing right now in my own training. And uh, it, it does work. I mean, I am seeing improvements over time, uh, you know, with my body composition, even though my weight is staying fairly close to the same. All right, let's move on. Let's, uh, we have Sean's got another question saying doing a four week mini cut, decently lean, but want to get ripped. A, a, a mini cut. Um, I mean, I, I can appreciate, I mean, there's, there's going to be certain times in your, you know, that are going to come up in terms of uh, maybe you got a vacation coming up or maybe there's something special on the calendar and you want to just drop a few pounds fairly quickly. And th there's nothing wrong with doing that. But ultimately, if you want to get lean and ripped, you need to plan it in advance. You need to give yourself time. I mean, you can only lose body fat so quickly, right? There's, there, you, there's only so low you can go in terms of your, your, your diet and your calories before you start having negative side effects. Because, I mean, if, if you just starve yourself, I mean, yeah, yeah th there's, you can lose weight quickly, but it's, it's not the best way. Uh, ultimately, I, what I recommend for most people who are trying to lose fat is let's bank on one to two pounds of body fat per week. That's how much you can realistically and healthily lose. Now, just do the math. How much weight do you want to lose? Let's say, for example, just throw some numbers. If you have 10 pounds to lose, be prepared to give yourself up to 10 weeks to lose that. Now, chances are it's probably going to happen quicker than that because when you do start a fat loss program, uh, in the initial phases, you're going to drop some water weight, you're going to drop some uh, bloat, and generally, uh, the, the faster, you will lose fat a bit faster when you first start, but after a few weeks, you're going to settle into that maybe one pound per body fat per week. That's kind of where you're going to settle into once you get into a, a fat loss program. But in the initial phases, you, you will drop weight quicker. But it's a good guideline. I mean, whatever, however much weight you have to lose, be prepared to give yourself that many weeks. So again, if you have 10 pounds, give yourself 10 weeks, right? If you have 20 pounds, be prepared to give yourself 20 weeks. Now, realize that chances are it's going to come off a bit quicker than that. But if you set yourself up mentally to, to allow for that much time, your chances of success and actually maintaining that fat loss is going to go up significantly. Now, 
with that being said, can you do a, a mini cut? Yeah, I mean, you can push the, the limits for the short term, especially if you have something coming up. Uh, what I would recommend, the, the fastest way to drop fat, if, if you're in a hurry, is low carb. So, I mean, I would focus on protein, vegetables, healthy fat, regular cardio, a minimum of an hour a day, plus weight training. That's kind of like the, the, the simple crash course answer to quickly losing body fat. A lot of activity and keeping yourself in a calorie deficit and keeping your carbohydrate intake low. I wouldn't eat any starchy carbohydrates. I would keep that low and get all your carbohydrates from vegetables and then, of course, protein and some, some healthy fat in moderation. And be careful with the fats because they add up in calories very quickly. I would keep that under control as well. Uh, to kind of throw some numbers out there for your carbohydrate intake, probably half a gram of carbs per pound of body weight. For protein, probably one gram of protein per pound of body weight. And for fat, about a half a gram of fat per pound of body weight. Again, this is kind of like a, a general one size fits all answer, but it's, it's probably going to move most people in the right direction. Now, I mean, if, if you wanted some more help with a, a specific plan to outline, for, for your fitness level and for your individual body type and all that. I mean, you know, send me an email and we can chat about it in private. That's fine. I mean, but what I just suggested there is kind of like a, a quick and easy one size fits all answer fix that should move most people in the right direction. All right. Wood Yellows is joining us and he's wanting to know about a lever belt or a regular buckle. Which do I have? I have the regular buckle on my weightlifting belt. Um, I have used a lever belt before. Honestly, it doesn't make that much difference. I mean, once the belt is on, it's it's not going to make a huge difference either way. I know some people like the lever, some people like the regular. Um, it, it doesn't matter, right? Whatever you have, it's kind of personal preference. But as far as actual performance, what's going to give you the, the stability throughout the core, they, they all work equally as well. It's, it's just really a personal preference of how you want to buckle up that belt. <laughs> Okay, let's see what else we got. Uh, okay, we got several people joining us. And, of course, this is where we get into the to part where everybody's saying there's no sound. There's no sound. So it's like a, 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 you know, a, a hundred posts here saying no sound, no sound. Okay. Emmanuel's got a question. Saying Lee uh, wants to know about intermittent fasting. Is there a minimum amount of hours to fast and still make it work? Does Apple co do, what and and does Apple Coder? I don't know what Apple Coder is. I'm not sure on that. Um, intermittent fasting. This is what I would say. If you want to follow intermittent fasting, shoot for a minimum of a 12-hour fast. And the reason why I say a 12-hour fast is because it typically takes 12 hours for your body to digest and process the food that's in your system. So by the time you put something in your mouth, it's usually 12 hours later by the time it you know goes out the other end, passes through, your body absorbs the nutrients, digests it, assimilates it, and you know gets rid of the waste. Generally. Now, of course, depending on the foods and depending on your metabolism and all that, it may be longer for, for some people, but you know, a good average, you know, range for most people is 12 hours. So if you want to kind of get the benefits of fasting, make sure that you're fasting for at least 12 hours. Uh, that's what I would recommend. All right, Anthony's got a question. Have you noticed any joint relief since supplementing with collagen? Are you still taking it? Yes, I am still using collagen powder. I usually strive for a scoop of collagen per day. So um, what I use is I just use the scoop from a protein container because the, the collagen powder that I have, I get the, the it's a, like a two, I think it's a, a one kilo container that I got from Costco. It's just a, a bland collagen powder and there's no scoop in it. So I took the scoop from a protein container, just whey protein, and I try to have one of those per day. Now, I built myself up to that. Like at first, I just started with like a, a, a tablespoon and then a couple tablespoons. And now I'm having this, a full scoop of it. So getting somewhere around 25 grams of collagen protein per day. And I find that it does help. I mean, knock on wood, as they say, I haven't had any 
major aches or pains in my joints since supplementing with collagen. Uh, so I think it's it's a nice addition. I mean, if you can go on Google and just search for all the benefits of collagen, but I mean, it's it's basically the protein that's required for your connective tissues, for your hair, your skin, your nails. Uh, it's it's not so much directly related to building muscle tissue, even though it can indirectly help with that, but it helps to build up the, the protein for a lot of other uh, you know parts of your body. Again, the the joint, tendons, ligaments, cartilage, uh, and hair, skin, and nails. So it's a uh, I, I think it's it's definitely worthwhile. I mean, I'm going to continue using it, and I have been now for, for several months, and uh, I, I like it. One of the things that I find good about collagen is it's if you're trying to lose body fat, it's actually a very satiating protein because it kind of has that, like the way I usually mix it up is I'll put it in with my oatmeal, stir it in, and it kind of thickens up the oatmeal a bit. Uh, sometimes I'll mix it in with a blender smoothie, and it'll thicken up the smoothie. Uh, but it, it has a, a it helps to satiate your appetite. So again, if, if you're trying to keep your calories down, it, it's great for doing that. If you're trying to eat a high calorie diet and you have a trouble with your appetite, then I would recommend having the collagen as your last meal of the day. So for example, like some people have like a maybe a protein shake at, at the end of the day, collagen would be ideal to have that. You know, because it's it does fill up your stomach, you know, it's, it kind of gels up and, and gives you that satiated feeling. So if you're having trouble to get enough food in for, for those of you who are trying to bulk up and eat a high calorie diet, uh, I wouldn't recommend having the collagen early in the day, save it for your last meal so that it's not going to impact your appetite throughout the day. But then the opposite applies for those of you who are trying to control your appetite. You could have it earlier in the day and, uh, you know, help to just make it easier to stick to a lower calorie diet. All right, let's see what else. Uh, another question here. Lee, can you help me rearrange my gym workouts and maybe advance them towards the end of the month? Sure. If you would like some specific help with planning out your workouts or planning out a, a nutrition strategy or whatever, sidebar me by sending me an email, lee at leehayward.com. Uh, if you're friends with me on Facebook, you can also message me there. I do answer my Facebook messages. Uh, or if, if you're a member of the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle, you can message me on our private members forum. Or if you have a copy of the Total Fitness Bodybuilding app, you can message me through there. There's a, a section in the, in the app there for Ask Lee, and you can send me a direct message there. But yeah, if, if you have a specific question or some you want some help, send me a message, whether that's an email, a private message, or whatever, and we can chat about it and uh, like say brainstorm some strategies to help you move in the right direction towards your goals. Okay, let's see what else. Okay, a lot of people are still, <laughs> it's, it's just going on about the, the whole no audio, no audio again. Uh, okay, this is another question related to fasting by Manuel. He's saying, does apple cider vinegar or lemon water break the fast? No, uh, it, that you can have liquid like that, apple cider vinegar and lemon water while you are fasting. I mean, technically there are some calories in it, but it's it's such a very low amount that it's not going to have any negative impact on the fast. And in fact, it will actually help because there are fat burning benefits and uh, to, to apple cider vinegar and lemon water. And it's also a great way to help to curb your appetite. It will help to aid with digestion and it helps to actually satiate your appetite. So if, if you're hungry, Drinking apple cider vinegar and lemon water, great way to curb your appetite. So that's something that I do myself, especially if you're following a fat loss diet. It's, it's a great crutch, a great tool to use to help control your appetite. And again, there's a lot of health benefits to it. So notice no side effects, lots of health benefits. Uh, it's it's inexpensive. So I mean, it's it's just, you know, positives all the way around. Plus it's, it's an alkaline. Even though like vinegar and lemon are acidic, on the outside, when you consume them, they actually have, uh, you know, alkaline properties on the inside. So they uh, help to alkalize and detoxify your body. So, I mean, they're, it's a it's a great thing to do. I, I personally try to have apple cider vinegar and lemon water on a daily basis. It's just, to, you know, for, for general overall health and fitness. Uh, let's see what else we got. All right. 
Dorm Front is joining me. He says, I'm over 40. I have the best body here. Abs every day for 30 years straight. Good for you. Congratulations. Please share your uh, your strategies on how to maintain a fit and lean physique for over th for over 30 years. So you're over 40 and you've been you've had abs for 30 years. So uh, does that mean you've had abs since you were 10 years old? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we got. Um, all right, Wood Yellows is saying, every other week you do a sound check, and this week Lee Hayward's The, the Mime Workshop. I know. I usually I, – uh, from now on, I'll be doing that. I, I was getting lazy with my sound checks because, like, every week I would say, hey, I just want to make sure you can hear me and see me before I actually start talking. And everybody said, oh, yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. So I just assumed you could hear me, and this is this happens to be the week that nobody can hear a darn thing. Um, all right, let's see what else. I'm scrolling through everybody telling me that there's no sound. Oh my god! All right. Um. All right, let's see. Where are we actually getting back into the actual comments? Okay. Uh, da, da, da. All right, okay, back to actual questions here. Oh, no, I'm not. Never mind. <laughs> I'm literally just scrolling through. There's no sound. There's no sound. There's no sound. Um, hang on, guys. When I get to a question, I'll actually address it. All right. All right, let's see. Um, Texas meat eater, no such thing as spare change. Okay, I don't know. That's not a question. Never mind. Um, shit. I'm trying to find a question here. Everybody's talking back and forth, so there's nothing directed at me here. So just bear with me. All right, here's a question directed to me. Oh my God, this is another one about intermittent fasting. It says, if you accidentally swallow your toothpaste during a fast, will it take you out and should you stop risking it and not brush your teeth in the morning? Gentle God, I mean, if you're using that much toothpaste and, and eating that much toothpaste that is going to ruin your fast, then slack off on the toothpaste. No, man, it's it's not that strict. I mean, some people make make these ridiculous rules. I mean, first off, I don't know the calorie content of toothpaste and the amount that you're going to put on a toothbrush is minuscule. So if you happen to swallow your toothpaste while fasting, it's not going to make it. No, you're not going to ruin the effects of intermittent fasting. <laughs> uh, okay. Roshan or Roshan is joining us. He says, can vegetarians build muscle? <sighs> Technically, yes. I mean, now the, the, the thing th there's vegetarian is a broad category because we, we have like vegetarian, you have vegan, you have pescatarian, you have all these different etarians. Um, if you are a vegetarian, but you consume dairy, you consume eggs, then I would say yes, you, you should have no trouble building muscle. Um, because you can get, you know, you can supplement protein powder like whey protein, you can consume dairy products like uh, Greek yogurt and cottage cheese, and you can get eggs. So you can bump up your protein intake with those foods and still you should be able to consume, you know, that one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. If you're vegan, I mean, I know there are vegan channels out there and they all claim that, yes, you can be ripped and jacked and huge and be a vegan. I've tried it and I couldn't make it work. All right. So I'll just give you my own personal experience. It didn't work for me. I, I gave it a shot. I tried it for six months and I made a video about this. If you want to go search for it, it's... Um, just do a search for Lee Hayward's plant-based diet, or, or I think it's called like my opinion of the plant-based diet. But I gave it an honest shot for six months. I really wanted to try and see if I could make it work, and I couldn't. I was losing weight, and I was actually gaining body fat at the same time. So losing body weight on the scale, but getting fatter, meaning I was getting softer. So that means I was losing muscle and gaining body fat 
while following a, a vegan diet. So it didn't work for me. Now, again, if, if someone else is out there is following it and you're making it work, then, hey, more power to you, you know, whatever. But uh, I, I find that I function better when I eat a mixed diet. All right, I find that the animal protein does make a difference. I feel stronger. I have more energy. And I feel healthier in general when I eat a mixed diet. So my, my personal opinion on this, now I know, I know I'm probably going to step on some vegetarian toes here, but I don't think, you know, the lack of meat makes a diet healthy. Or I don't think the lack of meat is where a, a vegetarian diet, it becomes healthy. I think it's the abundance of vegetables and natural unprocessed foods. That's what can make a diet healthy, not so much the lack of meat. Because, I mean, you can eat a junk food vegetarian diet. I mean, there's a lot of processed crap like, uh, you know, uh, chips and, and cookies and candies and all these things can be considered vegetarian because there's no meat in any of these things. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's healthy. So the lack of meat doesn't make something healthy. I think it's natural unprocessed foods. And if you're eating both animal-based natural unprocessed foods and plant-based unprocessed foods, you got the best of both worlds. And that's what I personally try to do, and I've that's what I function the best on. Now, again, if, if you're looking for help on becoming a vegetarian bodybuilder, then you know there there are channels out there that focus on that. And I would suggest you go check those out. You know, find someone who has figured out how to make it work and you know look to them for advice. Because personally, I gave it an honest shot. I couldn't make it work. You know, it wouldn't work for me, and I have no intentions of ever going back to being a vegetarian or a vegan or whatever <laughs> all right so moving on we have russell joining us uh have you ever experienced any level of body dysmorphia comparing yourself negatively to others who are more fit if yes what's the best advice you can give someone to overcome negative comparisons that's a great question and i think everybody at some level has dealt with body dysmorphia you're never good enough uh at some level now it can be minor where you just want to you know use it as motivation to actually improve yourself and i think that's healthy in a way you know if, if you have a minor level of this and it's motivation for you to work out regularly it's motivation for you to eat clean and it's motivation for you to do all the stuff you know you should do then that's actually good right having that drive because if you if you don't feel any dissatisfaction with your body then i mean you could be like a a 400 pound slob and say hey i don't care i mean I, i'm happy with the way my body looks even though it looks like a, a blob right if you so if you don't have any dissatisfaction with your body that's ultimately health uh, unhealthy but if you have a little bit of dissatisfaction <clears throat> excuse me that's actually good because that's going to motivate you to take action and improve it Right? If you don't give a shit, then you're not going to do anything. So, yeah, I have, and I still deal with that. I mean, you know, when I go to the gym sometimes and I see someone else who's in much better shape or I go to bodybuilding shows and I see people who are in shape. I mean, it's it, it motivates me. I mean, yeah, I mean, I feel dissatisfied with myself and it motivates me to want to push myself harder. But it's not to the point where, like, I'm going to get depressed or, or it's going to be, you know, prevent me from from functioning or, or whatever like I know some people are going to break down and cry because they're they're not as in good a shape as someone else or or it really just messes them up mentally I mean I'm not at that stage and I mean I, if, if you are at that stage then you know you need some psychological help but if you just use it for what it is you know as motivation to improve it's almost like that competitive drive I think that's actually a good thing so, uh, you know, you, you really need to kind of just reframe these things. You know, what, what some people might consider negative, you know, you can actually reframe it as a positive and use it for motivation. And that's the way that, that I use it, right? So when I see someone who's in better shape and I'm feeling like I'm, I feel fat and, and out of shape, then I'm like, man, like that's, that's motivation. That's more motivation to stick to my guns and to do what I know I need to do. So like I say, you, you, can, you can turn it around and make it positive. All right, let's see what else we've got. Uh, Frederick's joining us. He says, sometimes I get dairy from protein. I use skim milk in the morning, one protein shake in the midday, Greek yogurt at night. I get dairy from that. Does that mean I don't absorb the protein? What? <laughs> sometimes I get a little dairy from protein. I use the skim milk in the morning. One. I'm not sure where that's come from, but um, 
you can still consume dairy products with you. Like if you want to mix your protein shakes with milk and you'll still absorb the protein. Um, yeah. So no, you, you're, that's, that's not going to be an issue unless of course you have some intolerance to, to dairy and that's usually related to lactose. If you have a dairy intolerance, then, you know, maybe you will have some problems and how you'll know if you have a dairy intolerance is when you eat dairy food, you can probably hear my son out there squealing and playing and doing whatever he's doing. That's, that's fine. That's normal in the Hayward household, right? Screaming babies is, is normal around here. So we'll, we'll continue on. Uh, but again, getting back to the dairy question, if, if you have a, a, a dairy intolerance, you'll know because whenever you eat dairy foods, milk, yogurt, cheese, whatever, uh, you'll probably feel bloated and gassy, you know, have cramps or pains in your abdominals. It's just, it's not going to feel good, right? You're not going to feel good afterwards. And if that's the case, that could be a sign that you have some sort of intolerance and it'd be worth getting it checked out to see, you know, so you can actually properly diagnose it. And if that's the case, then obviously, yeah, you'd want to avoid dairy foods and, and look for other protein sources instead. But if you can consume dairy, then it, it's a great source of protein, you know? So personally, uh, I don't drink milk, but I will have cottage cheese and Greek yogurt. Those are my two, uh, two dairy foods that I do eat. And I will supplement with whey protein as well, which is technically dairy as well. I, I find from a digestion, like milk is higher in lactose than Greek yogurt or cottage cheese. So I find that the, the Greek yogurt and cottage cheese in moderation sits very well with my stomach. But if I drink a lot of milk, it, it, I, I do get that bloated, gassy feeling. So that's why I, I personally don't like the milk, but I will have the, the, the yogurt and cheese. All right, let's see what else we've got. Hero Keep Marching On is joining us, and he says, every time I bench press, uh, my chest doesn't burn. Why is that? Today I finally lifted 45 pounds for six reps. All right, if you... All right, so you've lifted 45 pounds for six reps, and I'm assuming that's a personal record because you you're, you know, you said today you finally did it. That means you're a beginner, right? Because in, in the greater scheme of things, 45 pounds for, for six reps is, is relatively light. You know, I'm not, I mean, again, I'm not knocking you for, for what you've done. I mean, it's, every bit of progress counts, whether you're just starting off or whether you're, you know, you're advanced. But chances are you're at the stage where you just need to build more muscle. When, when you don't have a lot of muscle development, it's sometimes hard to feel the muscles working. And when you're in this stage, you kind of just have to like go through the motions in order to actually build some muscle on your frame. And this, this is universal for a lot of people. I mean, when you're new and you know, your muscles are not developed, it's harder to have that mind muscle connection. But as you build more muscle, as they become more developed, you will get more of a mind muscle connection. Meaning that as you're doing your exercises, you're going to feel those muscles working. But in that initial phase, when you're building your body up, you'll probably go through a phase of, you know, like you're doing an exercise, maybe you're doing bicep curls and you're like, I really don't feel my biceps burning or, you know, I'm doing leg extensions and I really don't feel my quadriceps working or in this case, bench presses and you don't really feel your chest. Just focus on doing it with proper form and increasing the weight over time so that you are getting stronger. And then as you build up your strength, as you build up your muscle, then you will gradually develop more of a mind muscle connection. Now, with that being said, if there are certain exercises that you do feel your chest working, let's say like a pec deck fly, maybe you, you do that and you, and you can actually feel your chest muscles working, then it's okay to do that at the start of your workout to get that mind muscle connection, that activation going on, and then do your bench presses afterwards. You know, so you, you, you pump up the muscle with an isolation exercise, pre-exhausted this is known as, and then do your compound exercise afterwards, and you'll probably have a better mind-muscle connection and actually feel the muscle working. The only downside to that is when you pre-exhaust a muscle at the beginning, you're not going to be able to lift as heavy with the compound exercises afterwards. So it's, you know, there's like six of one, half a dozen of the other in terms of the trade-off. Uh, but that's something that you can experiment with if you want to try and get more of that mind-muscle connection. But rest assured that as you get bigger, as you get stronger, and as you become more development, it'll be easier to actually feel the muscles working. You just kind of have to go through this initial phase at the beginning. Okay. Uh, 
All right, let's see what else we have. Um, okay, there's a make a video on shoulder impingement problems. I well, I do have some videos about uh, shoulder warm ups, rotator cuff exercises, and some shoulder mobility. So if you do a search for like Lee Hayward rotator cuff, you'll see some of that. A lot of those exercises are, are universal like if you have mobility issues in your shoulders uh, that can help uh, but as far as actual nerve impingements um, that's something if, if you do have a shoulder impingement I would recommend getting it checked out by a physiotherapist who can diagnose your individual situation and see what it is that you may have done because when it comes to impingements sometimes where you're suffering the symptoms is not the root cause. And I'll kind of share a, a, a quick story here. Um, a lot of times nerve impingements are caused in the neck. And you may experience pain in your hands, in your arms, your elbows, your shoulders, maybe even down your legs. It could be somewhere else you're fearing, feeling the pain and the side effects. But the root cause could be, something, again, like maybe it's a nerve impingement in your neck. And I actually, a few years ago, I suffered this. And I made a video about it because I was having pain in my hands and in my fingers. And I couldn't understand where it was coming from. I mean, I thought it, I did something to my hand. I mean, if you have pain in your hand and in your fingers, you're like, well, what did I do to my hand and fingers? And went to my doctor, got it checked out. And what ultimately had happened is I had a nerve impingement in my neck, which was causing you know, that wasn't sending the signals and the circulation down through the shoulders, down through the arms and all the way to the fingertip. So I actually ended up doing neck exercises to loosen up my neck and to release the nerve impingement there, which healed the pain that I was feeling in my fingers and in my hand. So sometimes it's kind of messed up. Like it, it doesn't make sense on the surface, but when you kind of like dig deeper and understand how the body works, then it does make sense. So, you know, if you're having an issue with your shoulders, it'd probably be worthwhile to get it checked out by a good physiotherapist who can diagnose your situation. I mean, maybe it is a shoulder problem, or maybe it's a problem with the nerve impingement somewhere else that's causing the symptoms to travel down through to your shoulders. So it's kind of hard for me to, you know, I mean, I, I, physically, I can't diagnose this through a comment on YouTube. I mean, it's impossible. I, it's, you need to actually work with someone who can be there in person, address your situation, take you through some different exercises and figure out exactly what mobility issues you're dealing with and address your situation in person. So if, if this is a problem that's been going on for a while, don't put it off any longer. Go get it checked out and uh, I think you'll be much better off because of it. Uh, Shane is asking, do you think it's okay for kids to drink protein powder? If if you're, yes, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just answer it really quick, but I'll, I'll do so in a, in, in moderation. When it comes to protein, the whole idea, you know, like one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day, that's a, a good general rule of thumb. And most kids can probably get that much protein through their solid food. Uh, so there's not, not that there's anything necessarily wrong with protein powder. I mean, protein powder is even found in infant formula. If you look at the label of infant formula, I mean, a lot of times it has like whey protein in there or whatever different protein source it is. So protein powder is not bad, but is it necessary? Um, so, you know, for, for a child to be supplementing protein shakes, for example, I mean, I, I would personally rather than have more solid food but if they do have some protein, it's not a big deal. Like I'll give you an example. I like to use protein powder in certain recipes. Like I'll make homemade uh, high protein pancakes and we'll put whey protein powder in there. I'll make my own high protein ice cream and I'll put whey protein in there. And my two year old son will eat the pancakes and he'll eat the ice cream that I make. So indirectly, he's having protein powder from having the high-protein pancakes and the high-protein uh, uh, ice cream. But, I mean, it's not like I'm mixing them up with a protein shake in a shaker cup and say, hey, you know, slam this down, right? So it's safe for kids to, to consume, but look at it from the greater picture. I mean, how much do they want to consume? I mean, my two-year-old son is around 30 pounds. I mean, a scoop of protein powder is like 25 grams of protein. So, I mean, he could get almost his entire day's protein in a scoop. So, I mean, put it in proportion, right? You know, you don't need 
if, if the kids are going to have protein, it, they don't need a lot of it. So the little bit that he's getting like in a, in a high protein pancake or a little bit that he's getting in the, the high protein ice cream that I make, that's fine. I mean, that's in moderation. And of course that's in proportion to his body weight and everything else. But you know, like a scoop of protein for, for a child is almost like, you know, you or I taking like 200 grams of protein from protein powder a day. Right. So, you know, just, just keep it in proportion to their overall protein intake. All right. I got a weird question here. Uh, Gu, Gu, Rav or Rat, Gu Rav, G O U R A V. Gu Rav says, my testes are not in balance. Please help. Um, I mean, I try not to laugh. I know it's a it's an issue for you, or you wouldn't post it here. But uh, your testicles shouldn't be in balance. I mean, they don't hang side by side. Usually, you got one higher than the other, and that kind of gives them room to to move around down there. So, if one is higher than the other, that's actually normal. Um, but if if you have concerns about your testicles, go to your doctor, get it checked out. I mean, I. I can't really do much of a diagnosis here on YouTube, right? I can't reach through the screen and tell you to cough or anything like that, right? I, I can't diagnose your testicles. And please don't send me pictures, right? I don't want pictures of, of balls showing up in my email saying, hey, can you tell me if they're in balance or not? But just rest assured, if, if they kind of, one hangs lower than the other, that's normal, right? That gives you room to move, right? You know, so they can wiggle around. Um, but if you, if you are concerned or you have any pain or discomfort or something doesn't feel right down there, go to your doctor and get it checked out, right? Don't go posting on social media about your, your testicles. Uh, all right, moving on. Uh, okay, we already answered the question about shoulder impingements. All right, he's getting to the questions. Have patience. That's Hero Keep on Marching. Thank you for posting this. Put these people on. Uh, uh, okay, John Too Fine is joining us. He says, recently I started doing deadlifts. My back sometimes feels stiff afterwards. Uh, no pain, just stiff. Is this normal as I get used to the exercise or should I check my form? That's normal. I mean, you are going to feel stiff in the muscles after you work them, especially if, if you're new to doing an exercise. So you just started doing deadlifts. Yeah, totally normal to feel pain in, in your back or, or muscle stiffness afterwards. However, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be checking your form because the deadlift is a very technical exercise. I know it's a simple exercise. Like how, how, more, how much more simple can it be? You put weights on a barbell and you lift it off the ground. I mean, that's ultimately what you're doing. But there's a lot that goes into it, right? There's a lot of technique that goes into a proper deadlift. And then there's also all kinds of different deadlift variations. Right? You have a conventional deadlift. You have a sumo deadlift. You have a stiff leg deadlift, a Romanian deadlift. And they're all different, right? There are similarities, but they're all different. And they're and so they're, depending on what variation you're doing, you really need to nail down your technique. Uh, what often happens for a lot of people is they end up using too much lower back and not enough legs and hips when they're deadlifting. So... If you want, I've got a lot of deadlift tutorial videos. If you just do a YouTube search for Lee Hayward deadlift, you'll see all my videos. I've, I've got videos there for the conventional deadlift. I've got videos. Uh, one that I did that was quite good, if you do a Lee Hayward uh, deadlift form critique, I think it's called, and I actually take a video that one of my coaching students sent me, and I break down his form, and I point out the the points where his form was breaking down and then I went in and showed how to correct it. So it's, it's a side by side of like, you know, bad form and good form. So sometimes that can be helpful. Uh, another one that I did recently was covering the difference between a Romanian deadlift and a stiff leg deadlift. And I did it in the same type of fashion. Um, so again, just, just do a Google search, not a Google search, a YouTube search for Lee Hayward deadlift. And you'll see my deadlift videos because I have several tutorials that break down proper form. And, of course, you're also going to see other videos out there as well, right? I mean, there's a lot of guys have deadlift videos. Now, I can't necessarily comment on the quality of other people's deadlift videos, but I'm quite proud of my own, if I do say so myself. So I would suggest my own. I can't really suggest anybody else's at this time. All right, let's move on. All right, Sean is saying, Lee, would you ever do a boxing match? The answer is no. All right, next question. Um, 
Russ saying much love. Thanks for all the info. All right, you're welcome. Okay. I'm just watching Google Box Lee on channel four. Quite funny, Mace. I don't know what Google Box Lee is on channel four. All right. All right. Hero, keep on marching. Says, I'm a newbie. I'm 19 years old. Thanks. All right. Well, hey, good for you, man. Congrats for uh, tuning into the video chat and for uh, uh, taking up the adventure of uh, bodybuilding and fitness. 19 is a good age to start. Like any, any time throughout your teenage years is really a good age to start. Um, you know, because right now at, at 19, like your testosterone levels, your growth hormone levels, all your natural anabolic hormones are at their peak. So right now you will make the best progress because your body is primed for growth, right? So it's, it's uh, working out in your teenage years is always a good time to start, right? I mean, ideally... Start working out when you're in your teens, but the next best time to start working out is is now, <laughs> right? Regardless if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, or wherever, start now, right? You'll never be as young as you are right now, so start now and take advantage of it. But I always appreciate it when I see people starting off in their teenage years because, you know, like I say, you can really maximize those natural gains. You know, when I started off, uh, I was actually 12 years old when I started working out, so I had all my teenage years and what I found in my early teenage years, like, you know, 13, 14, 15, that range, I didn't really, I, I did make gains, but it wasn't really impressive gains. And then when I got into my later teenage years and, you know, my testosterone levels and growth hormone, all that started to really, you know, kick in, if you will. Also became more interested in girls at that time too. But once your, your natural testosterone levels start to, to spike, then the gains, you really notice the difference. So in my early teens, I, you know, I didn't make a lot of muscle gains, but in my later teens, I made a lot of muscle gains. You know, I mean, I had a lot of people accusing me of, of taking steroids and everything else. And it was just because I was working out at the time when my body is primed for growth. So you can really piggyback off that. And I made a lot of gains throughout my uh, later teenage years, right? From 17, right on up into my early 20s was like my prime for, for packing on muscle mass. All right, let's move on. Who else we've got here? Uh, Ashwin's joining us. He says, I started with a basic jog in the park. I used to jog for three kilometers every day uh, of one hour, whichever is early, or one hour, whichever was earlier. Okay. After four days, my feet started to hurt so bad that I couldn't jog. My feet hurt really bad, and I stopped. Um, I'm not a big fan of running slash jogging because I find that it does, it's a lot of impact. You know, it's a lot of impact on your feet, your ankles, your knees. You know, a lot of times you get shin splints, especially if, if you're a heavy set. You know, if, if you are got a bit extra weight on, whether that's muscle weight or body fat weight, Jogging is going to place a lot of impact on your joints. So I'm not a huge fan of, of jogging for, for cardio. I prefer to do low impact cardio. So my personal favorite, walking, cardio machines at the gym, and bike riding. That's what I do for cardio. I mean, sometimes I might incorporate jogging with, with walking. Like if I want to do like high intensity interval training, sometimes I will like run stairs or something like that or maybe i'll go for like walk for two minutes run for one minute walk for two minutes run for one minute something like that just to kind of break up the monotony of it but i usually do not do a lot of jogging because i find that if i do it in excess or i do it too frequently uh, my knees ankles and and shin splints really start to bother me so uh, i prefer to do more low impact cardio as my main primary form of cardio and just kind of save the the jogging or the running for something that I do to kind of as variety to change it up from time to time, but not my primary form. So uh, that's what I probably suggest in that situation. Another thing to, to look at as well, your footwear. You need good footwear if you're going jogging. If you're running in cheap sneakers or you're running in flat sneakers or something like that, uh, th that's going to have an impact as well. So if you are going to be a runner, invest in good quality running shoes, right? That's that's going to make a big difference. All right, let's move on. Got a little sip of water left there. All right, I'm all out of water. 
So when, when, when my when I get thirsty again, that's when the chat's going to have to end. <laughs> we have Valley Deep joining us. And he says, Lee, greetings from Romania. Uh, every time I do bicep curls using the easy curl bar with heavy weight, my feet begin to tremble. Is there something wrong with my central nervous system or is it normal? Um, shaking and trembling, uh, that, that's that's... I'm not saying it's it's normal, but it, it's it is quite common, especially if, if you're fairly new to lifting, and it's just it's kind of hard to explain why it why it actually happens. But sometimes we just we just kind of shake and tremble a little bit. You know, you might be doing an exercise, especially if you're straining, and, and your body just shakes. Like um, I've even seen it with advanced lifters when they're pushing heavy, like pushing their max. Like power lifters, you know, when they're pulling a heavy deadlift, sometimes you'll see their, their shake if they're squatting, benching, whatever. I mean, I think anytime you really exert yourself with, with maximum effort, it's kind of normal for your body to, to shake. Um, what I would recommend, especially, I mean, seeing you're doing a bicep curl, I mean, that's not a max effort power move. The biceps tend to respond better to... Uh, lighter weight, better form, and really focusing on squeezing and contracting the muscle and not just trying to move a heavy weight from point A to point B. So try lightening up the weight a little bit, maybe increase the reps or increase the sets to get more volume and more time under tension. Uh, even slow down the tempo of your reps. So instead of doing them faster, you're using the lighter weight, but doing slower, more concentrated reps and, and see if that makes you feel better, right? Because I mean, it, it does feel awkward when you're doing an exercise and you, you have that trembly, shaky feeling. I mean, I, I've experienced it myself and it doesn't feel good You just because you feel so unstable. But try uh, different variations. I mean, you could try doing dumbbells instead of the easy curl bar. Uh, you could try doing them seated if that makes you feel better. Or like I said, just try using lighter weight and better quality form and see if that helps. You know, I think lightening up the weight and slowing down your tempo will probably give you a better bicep workout uh, with with less of this trembly feeling that you're getting. Now, with that being said, if it continues to happen, right? I mean, you're you're you feel shaky, and maybe it's even continuing on outside the gym. Then go to your doctor and get it checked out. I mean, when in doubt, get it checked out, right? I mean, I'm giving you a few suggestions here that you can use to kind of, you know, maybe make a few tweaks and see if that helps. But again, if if it doesn't help, or you or you have any uh, questions, or it continues, you know, like say. Don't, don't hesitate to get it checked out by a professional. Right? I'm not a doctor. I don't claim to be one. I don't even pretend to be one on YouTube. I'm just a, a dude who's been working out for 20 plus years. I love this and I love helping people and I'll share my advice and knowledge if I can. But I also know my limits. So, I mean, if this is outside my scope, I'm going to refer you out to someone who can probably help you better. And that would be a, a doctor or a physiotherapist. All right, let's see what else we got. Uh, Oren is joining us. He says, Lee, would you recommend doing deadlifts on a back day or a leg day or why? It really depends on how you want to split up your training. A lot of power lifters will actually combine squats and deadlifts on the same day because squats and deadlifts work both the same major muscles. Now, the deadlift tends to work more of the back. The squat tends to work more of the legs. But the back, hips, and legs come into play with both squats and deadlifts. So it really depends how you want to split up your program. Right? There's, there's no right or wrong here. Um, you know, you, you can do deadlifts on a back day. You can do it on a leg day. Generally, the way that I go about it myself is if I'm going to do heavy deadlifts on, like, let's kind of zoom out a section here. Now, let, let's say I'm training back and legs in the same week, which, you know, I normally do. And let's say on back day, I want to do heavy deadlifts. Then on leg day... I probably wouldn't do heavy squats. I might do another squat variation or I might do like leg presses instead. And then sometimes maybe like the following week, I'd reverse it. So then I wouldn't do heavy deadlifts on back day, but then I would do heavy squats on leg day. I find it very hard for most people to do heavy deadlifts and heavy squats in the same week because there's such a big carryover between squats and deadlifts that you probably won't feel adequately recovered enough to do them both especially if you're more advanced and you're actually, you're lifting a lot of weight. So you're causing a lot of strain and, and wear and tear on your body. You probably won't be able to do both in the same week, or at least not both to the full potential. So I, I would sometimes alternate it. Heavy deadlifts one week, heavy squats the next. 
And then for the other exercises, I might do some other different rowing variations instead of deadlifts on back day, or I do some, uh, you know, leg press variations or some other leg exercises on leg day. So that's, that's one way that I like to split it up. But again, it, it, it's personal preference. If, if I'm doing conventional deadlifts, I usually consider that a back exercise. If I'm doing a stiff leg or a Romanian deadlift, I usually consider that a hamstring exercise and I put it in with a leg workout. So, you know, that, that's how I would split it up. But again, it's, it's not necessarily a right or wrong. It's just how do you want to go about splitting up your workouts and, you know, just finding the best place to put those exercises in where it's going to be the most advantageous for you and for your overall program and recovery. All right, moving on. We have uh, Oisin says, Lee, I've got a dumb question, but I hope you can hop between, but oh, sorry, I got a dumb question, but can you hop between two workout plans you like? I understand that every three or four months I should switch plans. I personally would not do that because, I mean, look, you can do whatever you want. I mean, in fact, if you're working out, that's better than not working out. So, I mean, hopping between workout plans or whatever, I mean, that's better than not working out at all. So look, let's look at it from like a, a good, better, best scenario. So good is just the fact that you're in the gym working out. That's good. Better would be following a strict plan and following that plan through to completion. Uh, I think that would be better than hopping back and forth and just kind of being random with your workouts. Uh, so I would recommend one program at a time. But with that being said, you need to have an awareness about yourself to have flexibility in your approach because uh, I'll give you an example. Like last night I was at the gym and I had my pre-written workout plan. I don't, I don't have my workout journal with me now, but I had my plan in place and I was going to do all the exercises. I had them outlined, boom, boom, boom. And the first exercise on the plan was bench press. And I'm, I was set it up. So I was doing my warm up sets for the bench press and didn't feel right. You know, I was like, man, I just feel a little bit tense or a little bit awkward. So I said, I'm going to do a few more warm-up sets. So I ended up doing a lot of different warm-up sets, and they went pretty good. And so I, I started off with literally just the empty barbell. I always start off with the empty barbell just to kind of go through the motions and to, you know, get comfortable, make sure that the bench is set up properly and all that, the uprights are in the right position. Then I just did one plate per side, and that felt okay. Then I went to 185, and 185... And it did feel right. So I did a few sets. I actually did three warm-up sets at 185. And on my third warm-up set, I actually felt like a little twinge in my right pec. And I was like, man, that, did, that doesn't feel right. So I said, today is not a bench press day, right? I just, for whatever reason, the muscles are not firing properly. I just don't feel right. So I scrapped the exercise. And then I went on and I just did some isolation moves instead, just for lightweight and high reps to kind of flush the muscles with blood and to just kind of like active stretching with weights. So instead of doing the bench press, I went over and I did some really light cable crossover flies, just really going through that full range of motion to kind of just stretch out the chest and to improve the mobility. And I did several different uh, sets with, with different ranges of motion, you know, with the cables higher, mid range and low, just to kind of work the, the, the chest and to stretch it out. And I also did some light uh, pec deck flies and basically my whole idea was I just wanted to work the muscle, pump some blood in there and to stretch it out. So I scrapped my workout and I totally changed what I had planned because I knew that today is not a good day. I mean, I had that, you know, awareness that if, if I tried to push through it, I probably would end up, you know, pulling a muscle or worst case scenario, tearing a muscle. So you have to be flexible in your approach, even though you might have a plan in place all written down on paper and ideally you're going to follow that through but if if something doesn't feel right don't hesitate in changing it up right you have to have that awareness and if you don't you're you're going to end up getting hurt more often than not because you know things don't go according to plan a lot of the time right and you have to have that flexibility to be aware of that and to change your approach when needed so i mean i, I do it all the time i mean even though i go in there with a game plan I I'm, have no hesitation to go to plan B if, if something doesn't feel right. I mean, I'd much rather scrap the exercise or even scrap the workout and walk away, you know, live to lift another day versus then try to be stubborn and push through the pain and end up getting injured. Because 
I'm telling you, when it comes to long-term training gains, your ultimate progress in the gym, nothing is going to slow your progress down more than an injury. I mean, if you skip an exercise or you don't train to failure or if you even skip a workout or, or anything like that, I mean, if, if you go in there and do a half ass workout, that's not going to slow your progress. If you skip the workout entirely, it's not going to slow your progress. But if you go in there and get injured, that's definitely going to slow your progress, right? I mean, an injury could take weeks, could take months. And I mean, in some extreme cases, if you, you know, tear a muscle or tear a tendon or ligament, I mean, you may never fully recover from it. So injury prevention is number one when it comes to making progress, right? So that's that's my main thing. I mean, I'm always training in such a way that I'll tr warm up properly to try and prevent injury. And if I don't feel 100% confident going into an exercise, I won't do it. Or I'll do a, you know, a lighter variation of that exercise instead. I won't push myself to to failure. So, I know that's kind of a long-winded question to what you just said there, but have have a plan with your workout. That's what your question was. Can you hop between different programs? I stick to one program, but be flexible in your approach and be willing to modify it as needed. Uh, you know, if if things don't feel right. All right, let's move on. Uh, Wood Yellows is saying, how was your trip to BC? How did that go? I had a great trip in BC, and that's what I was talking about at the start of this video chat. I actually was going on for about three or four minutes talking about my trip to BC, and it was all on mute because the microphone wasn't plugged in properly. Uh, but it was great. The weather out there was, was nice. It was uh, around high teens, low 20s. So uh, for people in Fahrenheit, that's probably uh, high 70s into temperatures around there mid, you know mid to high 70s so it was really comfortable temperature wise for this time of year and uh, had a great time met up with a lot of people in the fitness industry met some uh, some very successful people some big time youtubers as well so it was pretty cool i must say i always enjoy going to different mastermind events and uh, meeting different people and getting a broader perspective on things it always helps me to elevate me you know, get around people who are going to pull me up to a higher level versus getting around people who are you know negative and pull you down so i always whenever i can try to get around people who are going to pull me up and uh, that's definitely what happened when i went out to the fitness mastermind out in bc all right we have mark joining us mark king is a long time regular of following total fitness bodybuilding i remember first speaking to mark back in 2011 i believe it was when we launched the 21 day fast mass building program. All right, let's see what else. Uh, Prec Car is joining us. He says, Sir, if I do three days a week of weight training with the same volume as a six day a week program, will I get the same results in muscle building? Tech, I mean, you're, you're right in that it's the overall volume for the week is what matters, but it really depends on your own individual fitness level, right? I mean, if. Trying to cram six days of training into three days might be a bit too much, you know, because, I mean, let's just say, for example, you're doing six days a week, one hour a day, and you try to do three days a week, two hours a day. I mean, you, you can make it work, but ultimately, this is what I would suggest. Try it and see how your body responds, right? You Because, I mean, I can't predict your, your fitness level, your work capacity or whatever. I really don't know your individual situation, but... You know, who knows? Give it a try. Try it for a few weeks and see how your body responds. I mean, if you feel that it's too much, then you can always scale back the volume, right? You can always change your approach, but give it a shot and see how it works. And uh, feel free to change it, you know, as needed based on how your body responds. All right. Uh, oh, another question came through here. Did I change the name of the channel? Yes, I actually did. What the, the channel that I had set up before was in a personal account and I actually switched it to what's known as a brand account and the reason why I did this is because I want to hire on a YouTube manager to help me to optimize my channel in terms of the keywords and the, and the tags and, and all that tech side of things so uh, I actually changed the account to what's known as a brand account so now instead of saying Lee Hayward it says total fitness bodybuilding which I think is actually better because now if anybody is searching for fitness or bodybuilding related things, it'll probably show up more than my name, Lee Hayward. And if you search for Lee Hayward, it's still going to show up. So uh, I, I did that. So yeah, you'll notice that the name of the channel is now Total Fitness Bodybuilding instead of Lee Hayward. 
And that's the reason why is because I'm actually hiring on a, a YouTube manager to help me maximize the, the videos. Um, because th this stuff is, is complicated. I mean, it, back when I started the channel, I mean, it was nothing more than me just posting videos. I mean, I had no idea of optimization and tags and titles and all this kind of crap. I just posted videos. And because it was the early days of YouTube, I actually got some good traction early on. But now there's so much competition. There's so many other videos out there that if, if you're not optimizing them, then it's easy to get lost in the shuffle. So I, I need to hire somebody to help me with that. And uh, so that's why I've changed the channel to a, a brand account instead. All right, let's see what else we got. Uh, Warheart saying, what's going on, Lee? I've got a question about leg exercises to isolate the inner quadricep muscle. If any, I find that the outer head of the quad is developing. All right, the inner quads. Leg extensions is a good one. Uh, you can pre-exhaust your legs with leg extensions or just do a lot of leg extensions in general. Um, it can be tricky sometimes, you know, to, to isolate the different parts of, of the, the quadriceps. Uh, you can experiment with your feet positions too. Like, for example, if, if I wanted to kind of isolate the, the, the teardrop area, I would do... Uh, a lot of, of leg extensions. Personally, I know that they kind of get a bad rap from some people, but I find that leg extensions is a really good quad isolation exercise. I find when I do them, it really has a big impact on the shape and development of the quads. Uh, also, different squat and lunge variations, especially doing full squats, where you go through that full range of motion, like the ass to grass squat, probably do more front squats. Front squats place more of the emphasis on the quadriceps and a little bit less on the hamstrings and glutes, uh, even though they all come into play. But uh, that's what I would do. Like you look at people who do a lot of front squats, like Olympic weightlifters, and they have like huge quads because they're doing a lot of front squats, a lot of squats in general, but especially the front squats because that directly relates to uh, the Olympic lifts. So front squats, leg extensions, lunges, uh, those are some that I would definitely do. Another one that you might want to do, it's kind of a, you don't see it done a lot, but sissy squat. If you have access to a sissy squat machine at your gym, which is basically just like this little brace that you, you squat in. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google search sissy squat. There are some body weight variations that you can do, but I don't think they're as good as if you actually have the, the sissy squat station that kind of anchors your feet in position. But doing that, really isolates the quadriceps and it stretches out your quadriceps. Uh, it's kind of the, the stretch that you feel in your quads doing a sissy squat is kind of similar to the stretch that you would feel in your biceps doing a preacher curl. So that's another good one to really stretch out the quads and it can help to activate that, that teardrop area. So again, those are some exercises. Just kind of recap. If you're not already doing so, switch to doing front squats. Uh, lots of leg extensions. Sissy squats and, of course, lunges. That, that would be some really good ones that I think would help to isolate that, uh, you know, the, the inner part of your quads. All right. Uh, what are you, what's your opinion on the floor press? I actually like the floor press for a, a variation of the bench press. Uh, the thing I like about the floor press is it kind of takes the, the leg drive out of the exercise because when I do floor presses, I just lie down uh, with my legs totally straight and I don't use any leg drive whatsoever. So it just really focuses on the upper body because uh, the, the bench press is a total body exercise. When you get leg drive in there, it does make a big difference. So the floor press can take that out of the exercise and it just... It's the same thing, only different, if that makes sense. So it, it, it's a different variation. It's something that you can experiment with. Uh, one variation that I like with floor presses is sometimes I'll do power rack lockouts with the floor press. So maybe just a, a top partial range of motion in the power rack. So I'll set the pins down at the bottom, uh, maybe set like a mat uh, inside the rack, lie down, and just do like lockouts in the power rack while lying down on the floor. And I find it's a really good uh, bench press assistance exercise. But yeah, it's right. I mean, there, there's all kinds of different exercises that you can do. And for the most part, I mean, you know, they all have a, a place and a purpose. So, I mean, it's, it's a different one. It's a unique one. And uh, if you're looking to change up your bench press workouts, you can definitely give it a go. 
How are we doing for time, guys? I'm going to answer another question and clue it up. Let's see what we got here. Um, uh, all right. From Beta Bomb saying, Lee, or B Beto Bomb, I'm not sure anyway. Uh, the question is, Lee, I'm in a weight, I'm on a weight loss diet for months already, losing one to two pounds a week, which is actually really good. And it says, but my lifts are stuck and I can't progress. Do you think it's because of the calorie deficit or my program is bad? That's quite common. If you're losing body fat and you're losing one to two pounds a week, which is really good fat loss, by the way, you're probably not going to make much in the way of strength gains, right? So focus on maximizing your fat loss if that is your primary goal. I mean, this is why bodybuilders have an off-season and a pre-contest phase in their training because you can't do everything in one phase, especially when you're really pushing the limits. I mean, if you're, if you're pushing the limits for, for building mass, you're not going to get leaner at the same time. If you're pushing the limits for getting ripped, you're not going to get stronger at the same time. You need to prioritize one or the other. So if, if you're in a fat loss phase and you're making really good progress with that, then then ride that out. You know, hit your fat loss goals first. And then after that, if you want to switch gears and focus on a strength program and bumping up the calories a bit, you can do that. But stick to one thing at a time and realize that when you're bulking, it's common that you're probably going to gain a little bit of fat in the process. When you're cutting, you know, it's common that you're probably going to lose a bit of muscle and strength in the process. I mean, it's, it's kind of inevitable, right? But just focus on, on, stick to your plan, ride it out, you know, hit your fat loss goals. And then for your next training phase, if you want to focus on a strength program or something like that, then that's, that's acceptable. But don't, don't deviate from your plan because you're, you're not seeing you know, the strength gains that you want, or you're maybe even losing a bit of strength, right? That's just part of the process, right? Have that long-term vision to see through, see your goal through. And again, that's why you will see advanced trainers have different phases. You know, they'll have their off-season mass building phase. They'll have their pre-contest cutting phase, and, and they'll stick to those phases until they reach their desired goal in each phase. If you go jumping back and forth, um, you're kind of like spinning your wheels. You're not really going to maximize one or the other because you're just haphazardly back and forth all the time. You really need to kind of like put your blinders on and focus on one thing at a time if you really want to get good at it. All right, let's see. Uh, what I'm going to do now is something I've been doing for the last several video chats. Uh, actually, I think I'm already at the end of the video chat. Okay, the area of the questions that came through. That's cool. All right, so right now, there's two questions left, and I'm going to answer those two questions, and then we'll clue it up. All right, Mr. Paperclip. <laughs> Gotta love these usernames. Mr. Paperclip says he's almost 40, and my job is in construction, so pretty heavy. I'm working out five days a week, push-pull legs, push-pull, but I feel that I'm beginning to take too much work. So I'm thinking of going to a three-day push-pull legs. Any thoughts? Yes, I think that's a great idea. Uh, the older you get, the the more recovery you're going to need. I mean, I, I've noticed this myself. Like the workouts that I could follow when I was in my teens and 20s, they changed when I went into my 30s, which then changed now that I'm in my 40s. And I'm sure it's going to change again when I get in my 50s and 60s and beyond. Um, you need to factor in more recovery time. You know, working construction plus going to the gym five days a week. I mean, that is a lot of total volume of work. So I think spacing out your workouts so that you're working out every other day or three days a week on non-consecutive days, like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday type of thing, uh, that should make a world of difference. And from a practical point of view, when I was trying to build muscle, like when I was in my bulking days, I found that I made my best gains working out every other day. Having that full day of rest in between each workout allowed me to go to the gym feeling recovered, feeling fresh and full of energy so that I could actually train hard and stimulate some growth when I went versus working out too often, too frequently, you end up going to the gym feeling depleted all the time. Like I, I couldn't give it 100% because I was I always felt like I was running on empty. So having those rest days factored in there will make a huge difference. I, I bet just that change alone, you'll make you'll see a new growth spurt over the next month 
just from scaling back to three days a week with the, with your workouts. So again, give it a shot and uh, let me know how it works for you. And, and I, again, you got a username, Mr. Paperclip, and you work in construction. I mean, I could see if you had your username like Jackhammer or something like that. But like when I s visualize someone who has a username of Mr. Paperclip, I see someone sitting at a desk pushing paper, <laughs> not, not working in construction. But anyway, give it a go. S scale back your workouts to three days a week and let us know how it works for you. All right. Last question, guys, and I'm going to clue it up. This one's from Jose. It says, Lee, how can I start getting back to working out after a three-year layoff? All right. You start back just like a beginner who's never worked out a day in their life. You start back with the bare bones basic. Step one, just go to the gym. I don't care what you do when you go there. Just go there. <laughs> get into the habit of going to the gym. That's the hardest part. You know, the just getting your butt out the door and into the gym is, is hard for most people. So even if you went there and you just walked on the treadmill and then went over and did a set of dumbbell curls afterwards and then left, I wouldn't. That would be fine. You know, just get yourself into the habit, schedule the gym time, and make it a regular part of your calendar. You know, like let's say three days a week. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or whatever days work for you. I mean, I, I say Monday, Wednesday, Friday because it just kind of flows together. But if you want to go other three other non-consecutive days, that's totally cool. There's nothing magical about Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, but go to the gym three times a week or every other day and just get into the habit. Make that a habit. Schedule it in your calendar just like you would any other important appointment. And don't break it. You know, consistency is the hardest part for most people. And if you haven't been in the gym for three years, then consistency is quite a hard part for you. So you have to get that consistency back again. And what you'll find is it's going to be challenging at first. But once you get into the swing of things, you're actually going to start to look forward to those workouts. And you'll you'll miss them if you don't do them. Right. I mean, if, if I don't go to the gym for, for several days, I mean, I feel it. I, I, I miss it. Right? I crave the gym. And it's a good craving to have. It's like the uh, no, it's like a positive addiction, if you will, to have that. So you want to create that for yourself. And uh, if you want help with a basic beginner's workout, just head over to my main YouTube channel. And I believe I have a playlist set up there on the main channel for beginner workouts. But there, if, if not, just do a search for Lee Hayward beginner workout. And I have a total body workout for beginners. And that would be a great place to start. So do that every other day and it, it just get yourself into the habit of going consistently. Once you've done that for, you know, one or two months, then you can probably move on to a more advanced program, maybe like an upper lower body split or maybe like a push pull legs or something like that. But just keep it simple. Do a total body workout, just one major exercise per movement pattern. Do that three days a week and you'll, you'll make progress from that alone. But again, it's going to take time. It's going to take some consistency. And what I'd recommend is don't get hung up in what you used to be able to lift in the past. Like maybe three years ago or whatever it was, uh, you know, you, you might have been at a certain level of development. Maybe you were in better shape, whatever. Don't try and compare what you can do now to your personal best back then. You know, that was back then. Now is now. So just focus on what you can do right now in the moment and don't get hung up on like, oh, back when I was, you know, younger, I could bench press 200 pounds for X number of reps or whatever. Like that, you know, you're not going to be able to do that as a beginner just starting off. So just realize it, go through the motions and just progress from where you are at this point in time. All right, guys, that's going to clue it up for today. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. I do apologize for those of you who were here at the start and we had the muted microphone issues. Uh, that was frustrating, uh, but nonetheless, we overcame it and had a good video chat because of it. So uh, thanks for tuning in. And next week, we'll have another live video chat. And I'll have the replay of this one with the timestamps posted up within the next 24 hours. So you can look forward to seeing that as well. Have yourself a great weekend. And I'll talk to you next week. Take care. Over and out.